This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. The whole thing started with a spreadsheet. DEA investigator Kimberly Brill was sitting in her government issue cubicle in downtown Minneapolis one afternoon in October 2007 when a package arrived from FedEx, not just via FedEx, but from the FedEx Corporation itself. On a hunch, Brill and another investigator, Stephen Holdren, had sent a subpoena to the shipping company weeks before, asking for all records on an account used by a pharmacy called Altgeld Garden Drug on the south side of Chicago. Brill and Holdren were what the DEA calls diversion investigators, who focus on the ways prescription drugs are diverted into illegal markets. Unlike DEA agents, diversion investigators don't carry guns and have no power to arrest anyone. The glamour busts of cartel bosses and meth distribution rings were typically as distant from Brill and Holdren's work as a murder case is from a traffic cop's. Most of their time was spent taking down shady doctors and pharmacy pill mills for over-prescribing and over-dispensing addictive or dangerous medications. Altgeld appeared to be just such a target. Brill and Holdren had come across it by searching the Internet for websites selling a drug called fentermine, a type of amphetamine. Fentermine is a controlled substance under U.S. law, illegal to sell without a prescription and heavily regulated because of its potential for abuse, making it a classic candidate for diversion. Brill and Holdren had little problem finding online sellers willing to ship it without a prescription. So they bought some using undercover names and credit cards in what the DEA calls a controlled buy. When the drugs arrived via FedEx, they had the evidence they needed to go after the pharmacy for illegal distribution. All of this was routine, the kind of low-level buy-and-bust operation that diversion investigators carry out all the time. But Brill and Holdren decided to look one layer deeper. They sent out the subpoena to FedEx requesting data on the shipping account used by Altgeld. Looking back later, it would seem almost preposterous that such a small decision could lead them into a maze of complexity and criminality, one that connected a small pharmacy in Chicago to a murdered real estate agent in the Philippines. But every chess match has to start with an opening move. Holdren wasn't at his cubicle when the FedEx package arrived. He had just stepped out for a walk. So Brill opened it at her desk, extracted a small thumb drive, and popped it into her computer. She opened up the spreadsheet file on it and began scrolling through. Then she picked up the phone and called Holdren on his cell. Oh my God, Steve, she said, you've got to see this. Brill and Holdren were, by most measures, still rookies at the DEA, not necessarily the investigators first on the list for big cases. They had met three years before at the DEA Training Academy in Quantico, Virginia, and both were assigned to the Minnesota office by chance. Brill, a native Minnesotan, had joined the DEA at the age of 33. She graduated from the University of North Dakota Law School and worked for half a decade as an attorney before deciding to join the government. She was the portrait of a hardworking Midwesterner, friendly and understated, but relentlessly disciplined. I was a first child, a rule follower, she said. She was attracted to the DEA by the idea of catching doctors and pharmacists who had betrayed their oaths. Holdren had spent his whole career in law enforcement, also entering the DEA at 33, after stints as a Border Patrol agent and an investigator in the U.S. Office of Personnel Management where he conducted national security background checks. Both investigators were familiar with the basics of tracking web pharmacies, having undergone an online investigation course as part of their 13-week training at Quantico. Called Basic Telecommunications Exploitation, it covered how to use the Internet to build a case using controlled buys. Long before the national opioid epidemic began making headlines, the DEA had become concerned with the proliferation of prescription drug sales online, and the potential for web pharmacies to funnel dangerous medication onto American streets. But in their first few years at the DEA, Brill and Holdren both found themselves attacking what they felt was the outer edge of the problem. They would bust one online pharmacy, only to find that another had sprung up in its place. Like a pair of city cops who only picked up corner dealers, they weren't making a dent in the criminal organization supplying the drugs to the street. Brill and Holdren had been talking for a while about finding a case to work together, 50-50, something that would go beyond local pharmacy raids. We were trying to get to the head of the beast, as Brill put it. Somebody had to be paying, and somebody had to be profiting greatly, and they needed help running such a large operation. I don't think we knew. It could be anybody. Now, buried in the lines of the spreadsheet on Brill's screen were the outlines of a case unlike any that they had ever seen. There were hundreds of thousands of entries, and they weren't just shipments from one mom-and-pop pharmacy in Chicago. Instead, 
a single national shipping account, number 22328, was being used by more than 40 other drug stores. Collectively, these pharmacies were shipping thousands of drug orders a week. You could see that there were these pharmacies all over the country, shipping to customers all over the country, Brill said.